Hi, my name is Londe Yusuf. And my name is Reggie Williams. And we're the co-founders of Black Film Space. Black Film Space is a grassroots organization dedicated to enhancing the skill sets of black filmmakers and building a community of creatives. We host events such as screenwriting workshops, panels, mixers, and other events that are designed to support black content creators. In the next episode of the Black Film Space podcast, we interview Justin Davis. Justin is a filmmaker, gaffer, and electrician who has worked on projects such as Quantico, Black Klansmen, and the First Wives Club. We talked to Justin about basic lighting tips, learning how to light, lighting dark skin, and much more. And now, on to our interview. All right, Justin, thank you for joining us on the Black Film Space podcast. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm That's doing good. Well. It's nice and warm today. It's nice it is. It is. It is one of the last few warm days of 2019. Mm-hmm. So we really appreciate you coming on the Black Film Space podcast because what you do, I think, is incredibly important. And I don't, I don't think that black filmmakers talk about it enough. At least I don't hear about it enough. So really, I'm really excited to just get your insight and get, you know, hear more about your journey and and all that. So can you just tell us how you got started as a gaffer, like way, way back, how you got started and how you got to the point nowadays where you're working on projects like Quantico and Black Klansmen? Oh, well, I mean, pretty much... I got into filmmaking through photography. Um, when I was a kid, my parents used to put me in a lot of photography camps. I was in uh, Columbia photography camp from like age eight and probably until about high school. I, I honestly didn't really know what I wanted to do probably until like my junior year in high school, college um, because I was a computer science major for a while and then I transitioned into um, you know film and television. Um, but you know, obviously, at that point, you know, I, I thought I was going to be a director. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, at, and when you're in a class with a bunch of directors, you're like, well, uh, everyone wants to be a director. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it was like, well, how can I make a, a path for myself um, that's different than being a director? And then I just fell in love with lighting. Like, mm-hmm. it was my junior year of college when I realized that it was something unique about lighting. Um, I studied photography for so long, and I, you know, I knew that through photography you could tell a story. But then I just started understanding that, you know, um, that it also you can also start telling stories with lighting. Um, and I just went full speed. Um, I uh, took started taking eighteen credits per semester. Um, I double majored in TV and film, and then started taking theater art classes, um, took the, I took physics of lighting. Uh, I went to school in New York, so I was able to intern in the city. So I, I did a lot of internships in the city in Manhattan for a lot of uh, news networks. And I, I guess from then, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I uh, told my teacher, my end of my junior year, beginning of my senior year, I was like, well, if I could get jobs, would I be able to, you know, miss class if I could bring a call sheet? He's like, if you can take, if you can get a call sheet and show me that you are working, I mean, that's more than what I can teach you because you're out there in the field. Yeah. Um. So that was the the best thing that I actually could have done was be that close to the city, um, be that active at a young age, um, and yeah, I just took my, uh, I just took advantage of you know the opportunities that I had, which was awesome. I had fun. Cool. And and how did you, what was the first short that you were a gaffer on? I don't even remember, to be honest. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know when I left school, uh, my friend, he was doing a feature, and he was looking for someone to help out, and I think I was like a PA slash electrician. Um, and then something happened to the gaffer, and I think I bumped up to like best boy or gaffer, and yeah, I don't really remember. I, I I think it was Big Shot Caller. That was like a while ago. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was. A, it was a, I, it kind of happened so fast because New York is an interesting place because everyone does everything, and it's like so many circles, so many pools, and it, 
I don't know, at the time that I started, it was, you know, people just started using video. Um, so it was a lot of experimenting and people just taking small budgets and making movies. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there was a lot of opportunities at that point. So, And how did you get, like, can you ex just give us a little bit more about your journey to where you're at now? So, I mean, I'm I'm very ambitious. Like, I always try to do more than I, to do more, period. Um, and it's, for me, the journey d didn't really seem like I was really going far, um, just because I was always doing something. Um, and it seemed like I was just having fun with my friends, and it never really felt like work for me. Um, so mm -hmm. it, to me, it never really felt like a journey. It just felt like play. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the best part about it was, you know, all my friends were in grad school at the time. So we were doing a lot of grad projects. A lot of my friends were doing like small indie movies. And, you know, we were just having fun experimenting and, you know, no one was telling us it was wrong. So, you know, we were making huge mistakes, you know, that we never thought were mistakes. And we were just having fun and then creating our own looks and understanding what lighting meant to us and how we can use the tools that we had at the time um, to make something beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you like about being a gaffer? Uh, I like, I, I actually enjoy, um, painting, you know, um, being able to create something with light, um, and, you know, just molding and shaping, um, light on people's faces. I mean, it, it's, it sounds trivial and novel, but, um, I, I, I take a lot of, pride and, and enjoyment in it because it's it's fun mm -hmm. to me it's 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 because i had such a strong art background um it, it was just like creating an image for me um you know looking at a monitor or looking at a face sculpting it uh making sure that the light was at you know the right it was diffused the right way or you know it just it aesthetically pleasing to the eye to the camera whatever the mood you were going for um, and just achieving those um, those challenges that we were creating for ourselves. Because, I mean, we always wanted to do something bigger than what we had. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was the challenge that we always set for ourselves. It's like, how can we make this look great? Like, I know we only have like $2, but let's make this look like we have $5. You know? mm -hmm. And it was, it was fun. We, we pushed the envelope. We did things that we didn't expect were going to be good. And, you know, generally as an artist, you think that you're doing something awesome until you hear it from someone else that it's better than you thought it was. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, fun. Okay. Having a good time. That's dope. That's dope. So I, for me personally, um, you know, I'm a writer director. If you, I, I wouldn't be able to today go and light my own movie set by myself. Like I wouldn't know. You know, I know the the very very basics. Like I know how to set up a you know a, a C stand and that stuff. Like, but but I don't know how to paint the picture. Right. Um, and, and I feel as though not every director, but like the best directors, should know how to light a set. They know how to light their own set, even if even if they're not going to be doing it on set. There's going to be somebody else. They should at least have an understanding of of how to do that. Do you agree with that? I don't know. I mean, directors all. I've worked with so many directors where some of them are just focused on acting. Um, some of them are focused on the aesthetic and others are focused on, you know, the full composition. Um, you know, it's, it's based on style. I mean, everyone has their own style. Um, and you know, it, and it works for them. You know, they, they're the directors who they are because of that. Um, and they bring that to the table. Um, I don't think there's a specific path that I would say would be, would make, a great director mm -hmm. in that sense if we're talking about just aesthetics versus you know their process um but you know everyone works differently mm -hmm. like some people are very hands-on other people are you know just focused on the acting mm -hmm. and then rely on their team to make the image beautiful okay that's refreshing so i don't have to learn anything now <laughs> you can end this podcast right now if you're a writer no um however okay so there you can be a director and not be a master at lighting but are there certain things that one basic concepts you think that one should know well i mean the movies now are, are are starting to look more like documentaries like they're very 
patient. They take their time, and uh, you know it's very focused on you know character progression. Like a lot of the movies that are winning awards now, it's all based on just character development, and you're just watching these characters in their spaces, and you know it, then you understand that it's more about the lighting design opposed to you know lighting a human face. It's like lighting a room now. Mm-hmm. Now you're just letting them act within their room in their space and create their own world. Um, so you know. Again, it's per taste. Mm-hmm. It all depends on what you're doing. If you're doing a comedy, I mean, maybe you might want it to be a little bit lighter than something, you know, that's a little bit more dramatic. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's an aesthetic choice that a director chooses. Okay. When you're on set, who are who are you communicating with the most? Most likely, most of the times, it's usually the key grip and then DP. Um, very little interaction with the director during shooting. Mm-hmm. And what type of workflow? relationships you have with the it grip depends. and the DP. There's some there's some times where I'm completely autonomous. Um and there's also times when, you know, we're all as a team collaborating. Um and it just literally depends on time, uh, the scene, um, how far ahead we are, how far behind we are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it just changes mm-hmm. consistent constantly. And when when you're autonomous on set, so is it like you you've done the like the prep work before, like DP is like, this is what we're going for. And then you just go do your thing. Generally before you shoot, you scout. So, Mm -hmm. um, within the scout time and the prep time before the shoot, you know, uh, conversations are had. So, you know, I I would have already communicated with the director and DP about the aesthetic that they're going for, for the scene or for the day. Um, you know, we probably have a couple of day interiors, night interiors, and we, you know, we just work through them. And, um, in that time frame, uh, the director, it's not going to come to me and say, hey, um, at this moment, we need to figure out what we're doing for this because that, that will waste time mm-hmm. um, because he's worried about the actors, the actors are changing outfits, and he's, you know, in the ADs here trying to figure out where his day is or producers, et cetera, et cetera. So I wouldn't have any interaction with him or her. And um, But at that point, it would might be the DP where he comes in and says, I think what we said on the scout was great, but let's do something different because mm-hmm. we had that look twice already today. So let's figure something out that's new. Um, you know, maybe the sun, it's like noon, so the sun's a little bit higher in the sky. Or maybe it's late in the afternoon, so the sun's warmer and lower. And then we'll just create a look from there. Um, but there's also times where we planned it out so well that it's just me managing my crew to mm-hmm. make those changes throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Okay. And when you're, when you're, prepping and planning what what are some a few things that you might be looking for uh when you go into a space i mean the first thing as an electrician you look for is power um to make sure that you're going to be able to support whatever you're doing with on set within the um spectrum of set and then after that you're trying to figure out what we're trying to reproduce um the most important part um when you're lighting is what are you reproducing mm-hmm. because that that'll give you some kind of motivation for where your light's coming from what kind of aesthetic you're creating um so you know generally like times of day are the best time, best ways to kind of articulate that you're like okay because we all know what morning is we all know what early morning is we all know roughly what eight o'clock looks like and what noon looks like and we know what evening looks like we know what five o'clock versus seven o'clock looks like because it's a little bit darker at seven. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the best way to kind of start because you already have a rough understanding of what that point of the day looks like because we see that all the time, mm-hmm. you know. Um, now it's understanding the geography of that room, knowing that, you know, if it's north, south, east, or west, so you understand that the sun sets in the west and it rises in the east. Mm-hmm. So... Now you just have to figure out where the sun's going to be. And, you know, um, in that understanding, you know the sun's not going to come from two directions mm-hmm. because the sun's, you know, if it's on the east, it's going to be stronger in that window. Mm-hmm. And you'll have a um, a softer bounce coming from the opposite window. So you kind of start, you know, playing with those ideas of what's real, what would actually happen in this space, and you start creating that. Okay. Ooh, I feel like I know something now. <laughs> I can go location well, I mean, scouting. I mean, I think I think the thing that most people kind of get lost in um, when they're thinking about lighting is they get overwhelmed by that process, right? Mm-hmm. Because we 
forget that we're actually when we're making movies we're actually just reproducing something that's already exists mm-hmm. and you know we get lost in the idea of we have to light this scene and then you lose sight of what you're actually doing mm-hmm. because you just want things over overly exposed or you get caught up in saying a face is dark which might be important in your movie um but you you you're not you lose your motivation because now you're like overly lighting mm-hmm. um, and you have no direction so it's like this source is coming from both ways you don't have a key and you know it, it's a just a good basis to start at so you can kind of know where the light source is coming from you know where your hard side versus your soft side is coming from you know um, what's going to be reflective versus um, what's going to be dark so you mentioned earlier about how lighting is telling a story how how does lighting help tell and shape stories in regards to film uh the best way to really start by by doing that is uh horror versus comedy right mm-hmm. so uh a horror film would be darker uh most people would like to set horror films at night um because it creates that natural tension and fear of unknowing versus a comedy which is a little bit upbeat and you just feel a little bit more positive about it because you see everything is bright, it's jovial, it's exciting. Um, but telling a narrative with light is literally it's it's it just like it says it just like we're we're, we're discussing it's it's creating a story. How does it help articulate the message that you're that you're telling in the mm-hmm. moment? Um, is it helping? Is now in that room being dark in the back? Is that creating some kind of narrative that's um, heightening the story or the plot. Um, is it important that it's dark or is it not important that it's dark? It's it's just whatever story you're telling, it, it, it you have to just kind of start to contextualize what lighting means for your for your narrative. I mean, most people use colors to describe to you know create some kind of um, symbolism or imagery. Um, you know, red usually means love, but it also can be like the, something you know aggressive or fearful um blue could be cool or orange has like this warm feeling um so it, there's so many layers to lighting that um you can create some kind of narrative i mean mm-hmm. just like wardrobe where you can have all these different colors that can pop and work with lighting mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. what's uh what are some films or tv shows that you've watched and the lighting really stood out to you i watched a lot of movies okay i, I, li- I literally watch a movie at night um but i, I just love watching movies I, I i started kind of in like the classics when i was in school um like you know all the french classics like renoir and i mean birth of a nation was another one i mean mm. but that's more for editing and but i mean there's not much lighting in that one a lot of classics Currently, I watch a lot of European movies, mm-hmm. a lot of European movies, because I just like the patience. I like watching the character development. Um, there is, it seems as if they're very naturally lit, mm-hmm. and you don't really notice lighting, yeah. which is what I like about them. Um, and I think it, I don't, for me, lighting should not take away from the story. You shouldn't be distracted by lighting. If you don't see lighting, that means it's lit well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love that. Where you just see someone in a space and you're just like, oh wow, they're in a coffee shop. I don't really notice anything lit. Like it doesn't feel lit. Mm-hmm. I mean, at all. Like it just seems as if they're, is it like a camera in the room? Mm-hmm. And I feel like for me, that's when I feel like it's lit well. Okay. What are what are some common mistakes that you see from beginner filmmakers? I don't know if there's mistakes. I mean, everyone's creating, right? Um. And, you know, I think you have to make those mistakes to, you know, to get better. Mm-hmm. And you have to see them to get better. Um, but, you know, I don't think if it's a, if, if it goes with the aesthetic of your film, I don't think it's a mistake. Um, you know, some people enjoy hard light, but it might seem like a mistake to someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, someone might um, enjoy not diffusing lights either which is a, a hard light as well but i don't i don't know i, I don't really like that word mistake, okay to be honest it's because it's because it's art and mm-hmm. you i mean it's and it's an interpretation so it's like to that person it was not a mistake they mm-hmm. did that intentionally mm-hmm. 
Um, and as they're learning in their process, I feel as if you have to do those intentional um, decisions to grow. Because mm-hmm. if you don't, you'll you'll never learn what's what you like and what you don't like. Yeah, I think that's fair that that there aren't quote unquote mistakes. I guess what I'm asking is like because you you mentioned how um good lighting you don't notice it but i feel like i've watched you know short films from beginner filmmakers it's like i i can see the light it just doesn't seem right to me it doesn't seem like that's and most of the times it's because there's no contrast Mm -hmm. and contrast plays natural to your eye where you're you want less light so because it looks real um you know there's theories that show that you know every shadow has light and cool um, which are a lot of color theories that you'll learn in theater. Um, and then you just start understanding that, you know, a room is a space compared to, you know, this ideal stage that everyone, you know, initially assumes that we have to create. Because, you know, in the language of filmmaking, it's always three-point lighting mm-hmm. versus um, other lighting techniques. And we get lost in that. And you're like, well, let's let's create a narrative and let's create a story. Let's create an image. And, you know, that's why I loved photography, because there was a lot of things that, that I saw that played in the shadows. I mean, I watched Nine and a Half Weeks and I was like, this movie is beautiful, but it's very stylized. It's a very theatrical look, like blown out windows with like gobos of like uh, blinds on Mickey Rourke's face and Kim Basinger. And it's, it's just this beautiful movie that doesn't look normal doesn't look natural isn't there's nothing natural about most of those scenes mm-hmm. because it's stylized okay but it's a, it's not a mistake and it's just an aesthetic got it what what are some um some basic terms can you get can you break down some basic terms for us in regards to like what's the difference between a gaffer a grip okay a best boy uh best boy is like second uh so it's like kind of i mean it would be the person that deals with the inventory kind of manages the crew mostly. Um, some people consider a best boy someone who organizes the truck. Um, but, you know, it's it's an all-encompassing. It's like a manager slash um, accountant for the accountant for the department um, and someone who manages the inventory. Gaffer would be the head of the department for the electricians um, who makes the aesthetic choices. Um, also um, deals with the, de- with the director of photography. Um, and director sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, The key grip would be the grip, um, head of the grip department, and he is in charge of all the flags, all the, you know, the butterfly frames, the fusion frames, um, anything that cuts light. Mm -hmm. So is the grip also, like, setting up the C-stand? Like, who's physically setting up? Grips will set up. If it's for a flag or if it's for, like, a diffusion frame, the grips will set up the stand for mm-hmm. that. but if it's for like a light then the electricians would set up that i mean they would do all the sandbags they would do all the dollies and the dolly track and by electrician you mean gaffer uh well i mean electricians i mean electricians are in the department of with the gaff to gaffer the head of the department the electricians are um the technicians okay just give us a, like a little primer on different types of lighting techniques like yeah i mean yeah. Well, I mean, the general basic terminology that you would hear on a film set would be like a key light, which would be your main source, usually is motivated from whatever the strongest source in the room is. Um, Generally, if you're doing like an interview, a key light would be something that is, um, you know, the brightest on the face. Um, It's usually the the one that we, someone far side keys where it creates contrast towards the camera, um, which is another term, far side key. Uh, Near side key would be your key would come from the same side as the camera. Um, uh, Then you would have fill lights, which would be uh, just filling in the shadows of your face. Um, So you would, it would be usually generally opposite of the key. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the opposite side of the camera. It could be wherever you decide to fill. Sometimes, I mean, the most aesthetically pleasing fill generally is right above the camera. um, And then you'll allow the other side to fall off. Um, So you have that, kind of wrap it looks like a nice little wrap where you're not completely rembrandt where it's just one side that um is prominent and it's just dark from the nose to the other side of the face uh and you're just you know having a fill right in front which some people call it an omni light uh, omni light Mm -hmm. um 
or OB light. Um, and it's just to, you know, fill above camera. And it's nice. Um, it could be a balance. It could be direct. It all depends on, um, what you need to make, make it work in the moment. Um, you can also have, you know, side lights, which is the same thing. It's, you know, our kickers, which would be, you know, a three quarter light that just comes from the edge that kind of, you know, you usually do it on your fill side, um, to kind of like allow the face to have some modeling. Um, hard light versus soft light. A hard light is something that's direct, usually directional. Um, you know, in HD, most lights are hard when they're bounced, but, you know, technically they're, you know, they're, um, bounce lights, which is would be a softer source. Um, and then soft lights. Um, so there's like a lot of lights that are innately soft lights, like a zip light or, um, open face lights, uh, you know, like a Mickey, a Mighty, uh, or just like an airy 1K open face. They're just, they're innately soft lights because they're just a parabolic beam with a bulb that literally just, that's reflecting off of itself and then coming back where harder light would be something like a Fresnel. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, you know, um, a directional source, like a, like a headlamp or not a headlamp, like a headlight on a car, mm -hmm. uh, which is how they kind of came up with an idea because all cars used to have Fresnel lenses. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, like motivated lighting versus ambient lighting, uh, motivated lighting, I kind of touched on when we were talking about, you know, keys, um, but in filmmaking, it's important. Um, you know, you kind of want to always have a motivated source. It's like, um, where is that light coming from? Is it coming from that lamp? Is it coming from the overhead light that's in the room? Is it coming from the window because the sun's coming out and, you know, you kind of want to create your ambience around that. Right. So mm -hmm. it's like, your motivated source generally is your key. So it's like, all right, the sun is bright. The sun is coming through the east window uh, or the west window, whichever window. Um, so you know on the opposite side you're going to want to have either some kind of fill or you want to beef up the ambience in the room so that that light is just not this stark source unless that's intentional. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, okay. those, are, those are a couple of... That's you know, that's a great starting place yeah. for, for me and I'm hoping a lot of other people okay. so let's say let's say i have a budget of five hundred dollars mm -hmm. and i want to learn how to to light what lights do you recommend i purchase i think paper lanterns are an awesome light to have in your arsenal if you don't have a budget um because it's essentially this it's a soft source that will allow you to pretty much sculpt and mold anything it can be an obvious light it could be a light that Lights faces, it can be a light that um, lights rooms or backgrounds. Uh, you can throw it behind a couch and it just illuminates a wall subtly. Um, yeah, I mean, a paper lantern is a universal light. Mm -hmm. um, if you you know don't have a budget, it's like five bucks. Mm -hmm. You can just have to buy a bulb. What, what kind of bulb? Uh, I mean, I would say start like the lowest 100 watt bulb. Mm -hmm. I mean, 500 watt would be the most ideal because you'll get your bang for your buck. Um, a 1K bulb, if you had like a mobile base, would be something that you can do, which is just a larger base. Uh, standard bulbs are medium base. Um, but that's that would be the ultimate um, light to have in your arsenal. Mm -hmm. um, what else would you have? I mean, if you wanted to just have a couple of uh, like – Leekos, Parkans, those are also good filmmaking tools um, because they're also ambient lights. They're also a light that you can, uh, you know, do a light streak from a window if you didn't have any HMIs and you were just shooting in a controlled space. Um, uh, yeah. Um, what else would that be? Yeah. There's a, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of them. Sorry. I'm, I'm like trying to go through all of them for something if you had 500 bucks. Um, but See the thing about it is like there's also companies that would that cater to those kind of um, productions. Uh, like Adorama would be a good place to start because mm -hmm. those guys would, you know, they work with that budget range, um, so they would be able to. If you wanted a light panel or a light mat, they would be able to, you know, work within that budget. Um, Elephant Films would be another place that mm -hmm. would work in that budget too. So it's like you're not confined anymore, kind of, because there's so many vendors that are catering to that price range um 
that you might be able to get a nice package. Like, mm. you know, Elephant has a package, like page where they just have a list of packages where you can get, you know, a couple of kinos, a generator, and probably like a dolly for like 200 bucks. Mm-hmm. And that's like, that's, mo- that's, that's like pretty much a whole movie. Yeah, like, yeah. You, you can have movement and you can have lights. Mm-hmm. What about, how do you feel about um, construction lights? I think they work well. I mean, again, a light, most people get, like, again, people get caught up in, you know, this designer light versus uh, indie quote-unquote lights. Um, You could use, a construction light is an open, it's just an open face light, Mm -hmm. period. So, like, you know, it's the same as a Mickey, a, um, a Mighty, it's the same as, um, any open face source. Um, all you, I mean, you could use it the same exact way. I mean, they're 500 watt sources, and you can just use them into a bounce, and that's a bounce source. Now you have this big book light that you had from Home Depot or wherever you get your construction light mm-hmm. source, mm-hmm. and you can do the same thing. Do um, yeah, you can just have like if you only had a B board and maybe a little bit of diffusion, you can have you can hang the diffusion from the roll on the C-stand and then you could just bounce the construction lights into it. Or you can just use the, them as an ambient. Um, I wouldn't recommend them as a source for faces. They're a little bit harsh mm-hmm. unless you have some kind of diffusion. Um, but they're great bounce sources, great ambient sources. I don't think there's anything wrong with them if, if that's within your price range. Mm-hmm. I hope they're in people's price ranges. Yeah. They're like 30 bucks, right? They're like 30, I think 40 so. bucks. I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I mean, I haven't worked with them in a long time. But yeah. Um, so what what would you recommend for someone who who can't go to film school? Shoot. Um, just keep shooting. Don't stop. Like literally, like I, it's so easy now to shoot that I would not. I don't know why you wouldn't if you were interested. I mean, shoot anything. Shoot scripts that you half wrote. Shoot scripts that you don't have. Shoot. Just keep shooting. Cause mm-hmm. That's the only way you're gonna work on your eye. You're gonna work on your narrative. It's the only way you're gonna really kind of like understand what you're doing because you know you know we everyone doesn't jump into it knowing everything i mean you're you're creating your understanding of what you're doing while you're working Mm -hmm. um and you know film school's great i'm not knocking anyone for going to film school because i did um but you're 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 learning most of the times you're learning something that's 10 years outdated Mm -hmm. at that point Mm -hmm. just because it's a reference right so it's like you can't have something current because that's that wouldn't be possible. That means you're updating every single book every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you, sh- I mean, if you don't have that ex- opportunity or experience or exposure, it's. I feel like shooting is the most valuable thing because mm-hmm. now you're you're working on your eye, you're working on your images, you're understanding what light does, and shoot available. Don't sh- don't light if you if you if you want to learn the most, shoot available light. What is it? What do you mean? Like, just not bring any lights Don't at all? Don't bring any lights. Mm-hmm. Just shoot available light and see what the light does. And I mean, now if you're going to shoot something for festivals, I would not recommend that. <laughs> unless you're, you know, unless you've worked, you know, to the point where you feel confident in doing it. But just keep shooting. Like, shoot and see what the light does. And then you can just literally mimic what you like in those moments and just shoot test mm-hmm. and, and just keep shooting. Because, I mean, I've lit scenes with just desk lamps literally Mm -hmm. like scenes in movies and tv shows that you watch just desk lamps period that's amazing yeah that's amazing um did you have any experience like editing as far as like yeah like learning like to see like oh this is what i could have done better or this is what i was trying to. i'm not critical like that because that i mean for me i mean i played sports my entire life and i've watched tape on myself and over and over and over again and it, it it always just made me a little bit more cynical about how I went about it. And I, I, it's such an organic form of art that it's like, if it sometimes it just feels right. And, you know, it, you know, if you are always critical of how you did it and how you, you know, you approach it, um, you lose that, that organic element, right? Because mm-hmm. you, you make it so technical and you're like, sometimes you just need that, um, organic vibe on set mm-hmm. just to let it happen and just embrace it. Mm-hmm. What do you, what do you think of like um I know you've studied this but as far as like people learning without going to film school like just like lighting theory are there yeah. any books in particular 
Uh, I mean, if you want to learn about electricity, um, there's an electrician's handbook by Harry Box. Um, I don't have any of the reference books offhand that I would be able to throw out, but um, there's a lot of YouTube videos on lighting. Um, but I, I really recommend just doing it, like literally just getting out there and shooting um, because that's the only way. Because each camera reads light differently, um, and some people fall in love with cameras like Irie versus Red. Mm -hmm. um reds deep in the blacks and you know you if you light for a red camera you know you might over light an airy camera so it's like you just have to understand what those sensors are able to do and embrace it i mean you shoot a sony i mean even the a7s or a7rs or whatever they are now um you don't need any height mm -hmm. there's like moments where it's like dark in the room but you can still see images wow um and you know, most people are learning that way and they're embracing that because that Sony sensor is just so powerful. It's insane. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, that's why I say just shoot because each camera has a different sensor. Each camera has a different look. I mean, and some people learn to shoot based off of LUTs and, you know, that's another way. Mm -hmm. you, know, you said based off of Like LUTs, LUTs like, what is a, like a lookup table. So it would just okay. be creating a color grade um, that you would just input into the camera. Mm. White oh yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. I like I was saying at the beginning of the episode, I feel like a lot of black filmmakers aren't talking about this, mm. although I could be wrong. But it, it definitely feels like, you know, being the co founder of Black Film Space, I interact with a lot of filmmakers mm. and a, a lot of people are writer directors, just like you said when you were in class, a lot of people wanted to be a director. Um, do you feel like there are not enough black gaffers. I don't know about that. I mean, I know a lot of black gaffers. I mean, I was trained by a black gaffer. Um, he was a commercial gaffer, but I mean, I don't know. I, I just think we're out there. I mean, we're well, there's a lot of black uh, technicians. There's a lot of um, black DPs who were once gaffers. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I, I don't know if that's something that I would say is not prevalent or I, I forgot how you phrase it, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's definitely something that is there. Um, mm. No, nah, I don't No, nah, No, you're talking about on scale or are you talking yeah. about just overall scale Okay, compared to, you know, white people are the majority in, in yeah, America. I mean, I understand that, but I mean, I don't want I don't want to make it about that only because that's going to like literally depreciate the opportunity for someone else. Right. So, I want to embrace the fact that we're having a conversation of me being a black gaffer and hopefully someone else wants to be. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of black gaffers and the black uh, electricians out there. And, you know, some people, you know, enjoy shooting more. And, you know, you s generally see a lot more black DPs, mm -hmm. a lot of them, mm -hmm. um, that light very well. Yeah. Um, very well. Um, and a lot of black directors that, light very well as well um or understand lighting very well um but i don't know i, I don't know why um you feel that way um and in the sense that i guess you're you're articulating the fact that um i guess you're having discussions with people about black electricians and black gaffers no i just i just haven't i don't know anybody okay i know like hundreds of writer directors producers some cinematographers actors but just within the well, black film space community i just don't well, know that's anybody. a challenge to you guys <laughs> <laughs> so i'm like where y'all at because like if i'm working on like i'm going to be working on a, a project next year i mean i know you now but well i wouldn't be able to do it <laughs> i can't afford you is it no the... it, i'm a union member so i can't uh, do non-union work okay okay um, we could talk about that too, but, um, I don't know anybody off the top of my head. I, yeah. I, you know, I can tell you a couple of people, there's okay. a couple of guys out there. Okay. <laughs> now, there's a lot of guys out there. I mean, it's, and that's the cool part about it is like the thing that I did enjoy about coming into New York was I came in a high, high, high music video time. And that's where we mostly hang out. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of the black actors, um, and it's fun. It's it's very fun because, you know, you're experimenting. There's so much time. You're just creating. And, you know, for us at that time, I mean, I was hanging out with guys that I was listening to 
at home in the radio in the car and i'm mm-hmm. like oh cool this is cool mm-hmm. <laughs> kid, i saw you worked on kid cuddy's uh yeah. that's one of my favorite artists yeah so i mean you'll see a lot of us there i mean a lot of people just like to be there i mean because mm-hmm. it's a a very you know they embrace us in the sense because you know they most people identify with our culture there right um so it's comfortable um com- uh you see a lot of black commercial gaffers that came out of the music video world. Um, you see a lot of black TV gaffers and who are now DPs that came out of the music video world. Um, and I think that's where you see most of them um, because the money's better. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people in New York, because we do live in New York, tend to go where the money is. And sometimes, you know, the indie circuits don't op- don't offer that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, that's that's for sure. Um, so it seems like a lot of gaffers transition to becoming a director of photography, right? That's, it's a, it's a, it's pretty much a streamlined process. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's because learning a camera, not saying it's easy. Um, you have assistance to learn how to use a camera because you have a, a couple of ACs usually with you. And, um, generally, you know, if you know how to frame well, your assistance will pretty much assist you on all the processes past framing. Like, you know, setting up the camera, being able to understand uh, where the LUTs are or the, you know, setting up the follow focus, et cetera, et cetera. So once you're done with framing, the ACs can take over. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, lighting is like, unless you have a great gaffer, um, you know, you're kind of like, you're you're kind of at his, um, at his will. Mm -hmm. Like it's literally, it's, it's up to the gaffer and it's, and you know. Again, unless you have an aesthetic eye, which most people do, and it, lighting is something that you have to practice. I'm not saying that you don't have to practice camera. I'm just saying it's it's just a technique that um, takes time. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes time. Mm-hmm. But do do a lot of do a lot of um, gaffers turn into directors? Is that a a path that well, you see? Once, I mean, I've seen a lot of gaffers who became DPs that became directors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And do you, I know you've directed some projects and you've shot some I projects. I like, I, you, I think it's fun. I think it's exciting. Um, for me, I, I've done it only because I'm, I, I'm an artist first. Um, I, I, I like that my career is lighting. Um, and I think creating something, it, it just gives me energy. It gives me something, you know, different. And, mm-hmm. and, it, and I really feel that it allows me to keep going. Um, just always creating, doing something new every day. And um, it's important to me. Like, mm-hmm. even taking a picture a day or, you know, if someone says, hey, you want to direct this? I'm like, yeah, why not? Like, mm-hmm. Let's do it. The same reason why I'm here. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, you, you you called me and you said, you want to hang out? You want to do this? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> why, why wouldn't I? Um, and, it, you know, it's and it's just that pure experience where that you have with people and you share it i mean you know if you're a collaborator you understand it's like that that feeling that you have when you when you, everyone gets what they want and it's just like oh my god this is great mm-hmm. we did it together and there was no one who was like overarching um you know no one's ego stood out and we just all did it together and it feels great mm-hmm. and that's kind of where i came from that's where we started we all started in this like small you know student film circuit and became who we are now. Nice. Um, are there differences or what are the differences between lighting black people and non black people? I think people? it's beautiful. To be honest, it's it's I think it's all right. So the thing about lighting that we all have to understand is it's reflections, period. Like mm. um everything that we do is reflections. Um even if it's like we're talking about bouncing lights versus direct lights, same thing with skin. It's a reflection. So it's like what is the reflective source we're working with? So most people are looking at an image, and usually the image is a face. How does that image reflect the light that you're projecting at it? Mm-hmm. Um, so naturally, our skin, black people, um, or African Americans, or people of darker skin, yeah, are have a higher oil content. So it literally reflects light beautifully, mm-hmm. like because it's just like a natural sheen most of the times, um, and I, I I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, I really enjoy it a lot. I mean, again, lighting uh, lighting people with a with a paler skin is easier because it actually reflects light. Mm-hmm. It's it's naturally reflective, so you have to use less light. You might not even have to add a fill or a bounce because it's just going to naturally reflect whatever's in the room, mm-hmm. like an ambient source. 
Um, I think the, the one thing that most people kind of um, get nervous of when they're lighting a darker skin is trying to light it to like a 70 IRE or like a 60 IRE and, you know, not understanding that that's not a skin tone for, mm. for our complexion. It's like, I think 30 or 40 is an actual skin tone for our complexion because it's, it, you look at it on the monitor and it's like, I don't, he doesn't really look that light to me. Like, or I'm standing right next to him in the monitor and I'm like, he looks way lighter than he does in real life. And it's like, be honest, tell mm. the story, tell mm. the story that he is this complexion and that's who he is. Um, again, that's an aesthetic choice. Um, but I, I generally like lighting darker skins mm. between 30 and 50 IRA. Okay. That, that's amazing that you like <laughs> lighting black people, but what is an IRE? Uh, it's, it's, so if you were looking at it like a, a waveform or a vector scope, a uh, well vector scope would be something that you would watch a uh, color on. So if you were looking at a waveform, it would just be the line. So you would see it would go from zero to a hundred. Mm -hmm. Um, so zero is all, is like, black like that's absolute black mm -hmm. and then 7.5 is like what black on a camera is like if you look at a chip chart mm -hmm. it would be 7.5 IRE um and then literally everything above that um so it would be 70 is usually where most tv like news broadcasts set like that's where we want you to light to 70 IRE mm -hmm. um, that's pretty high. that's pretty bright it's bright i yeah. mean it's 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 bright. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, most of the times when I used to do a lot more um, uh, TV, not narrative TV, but like broadcast TV, broadcast TV yeah. I would try to light at like 55 to 60 mm -hmm. because when it is broadcast, they boost it. So whatever 70, it'd be like 80 or 90. So everything looks blown out. So like you, I would try to clip my highlights below 70 as my highest so that when i do broadcast and bump it because you know everyone has a different tv so mm -hmm. if you watch it on your television it might be all the whites are gone and mm -hmm. everything's super white um so i usually would have my highlights at 70 and then faces around 50 to you know 65 mm -hmm. probably the highest okay cool cool um depending on the skin tone of course mm -hmm. like obviously if it was a lighter skin tone it would sit at 60 because that's just innately where that pigment will land. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, a darker pigment will probably land around like 40 in the same kind of like world. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I mean, it, you, you also would have like um, false color to understand where things are and see where things are going. Um, There's just so many tools now like to, to utilize for lighting. I mean, it's not just a light meter anymore. You can use a vector scope. You can use a waveform. You can use false color. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many elements now for lighting. Mm -hmm. So many tools. You can make it very technical if you want to. So do you, do you prefer? Do you use a light meter? I use them all. I think yeah. they're all valuable. I mean, light meter is great for a quick ratio check. Um, it's like if you just and if you didn't want to run back to the monitor to look at it, it's a great ratio check. I mean, it's a always a good rule of thumb to, to meter everything because you kind of have a base and you understand throughout the day it's going to change, right? Mm -hmm. So you know where you are and you start to understand what your ambience is. You understand what, you know, your key versus your fill is, what you, what com how much contrast you have, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like kind of monitoring that is kind of like keeping some kind of like a stasis throughout the day if you're shooting the same scene. Mm -hmm. well, how, did, how, uh, how does one get into the union? It's a process. Um, you know, generally, to be a permit worker, you would have to uh, take certification. But depending on whatever craft you're trying to get into, you would have to take um, an aerial lift, and you would have to take a 10-hour OSHA class. And then each department has its specific um, requirements that they have. But mm -hmm. that's the basis for most of them. What union is this? Local 52 in New York. Is, but what is it? Is it for IIT. gaffers or is it for electricians? Uh, there, there's within local 52, there is uh, set dressers, ward, uh, set dressers, sound, grips, electric, medics, uh, missing something. Oh, BTR, sound. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so all of these positions couldn't work on an indie project? Or is if it just. They're, if they're union members. 
They could work on union projects that are non-union members. Yeah. So there's union and non-union. Yeah. Uh, usually an indie project, if you called your friend that just came out of town uh, and said, let's make a movie. Generally, that's non-union. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a, a union project usually has um, a contract attached to it with the studio and uh, all the elements mm-hmm. that would come with a union Got it, got it. Okay. So you could work on my project if it was a union project. That's correct. Okay. It has nothing to do with money. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I probably won't be union, (laughs) so probably not this time. Um, Cool. Well, thank you, Justin, for joining us. I feel like we should say more. I mean, I feel like I'm in the groove now. I feel like we should kind of touch on things, like, because I'm feeling really good right now. Okay. What do you want to talk about? I don't know. Let's, 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 uh, I don't know. I don't know what I want to talk about, but I think I feel like now I'm in the, the element. If you want to recycle some things and see where you want to go, because I'm, I'm I, I want to talk more about if if there's more. I don't know if there is more, but I want to talk more about lighting black there, people. Is there, yeah. Keep going. So I don't. I'm not sure what to ask you. Uh, well, I mean, there's so many examples. I mean, you know, Brad does a really good job at lighting black people. I mean, if um, if anyone's ever seen. I think it's let me look this up because I don't want to mess this up. I think it's Mother of George or Son of George. Yeah, well, it's one of those two. <laughs> I know yeah. what you're talking about. Um, but it's beautiful mm-hmm. and it's dark. It's really dark. Mm-hmm. It's a really dark movie with dark skin. Mm-hmm. But I mean, what he utilized was you know the reflective surface. I mean, I I, I think what he did was um, used very very very. Um, glossy makeup mm-hmm. so it just caught all light um and it was a beautiful movie i mean if you guys haven't seen it you should see it for mm-hmm. sure mm-hmm. um i don't know i mean it, his body of work is a lot of dark skin i mean you know the most recent one the central park five was, yeah you know very moody but it was dark skin and you mm-hmm. still saw people's faces and it felt real mm-hmm. um i don't know i mean this i mean it's, I, trying to think of other examples with dark faces i mean i know the movie that kind of got me into filmmaking was um color purple that was like my mother's favorite movie mm-hmm. <laughs> but i mean that's still that's steven spielberg i mean they're you know they're lit well um but you know i think it's the colors and the the skin sweating like you know all those elements that kind of played where you know, you, you saw the different flavors of skin and, you know, um, the nature of the lighting on that. Um, yeah, there's so many, so many elements. I mean, Native Sun, another great movie mm-hmm. where it was like utilized like darkness, but like, you know, with these darker skin, darker complexion people. You're talking about the new one on HBO that yeah. came out this year? Or? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, was, I think, wasn't it a Sundance one? Or? Oh, it's on HBO now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, um, a lot of them. Are there, are there more? Are there more techniques or tips that you can share with us about lighting uh, darker people? I mean, I think I think it's the same tips. I mean, I think it's the same techniques. I mean, a lot of people generally use book lights or softer sources to light faces. Period, because we're mm-hmm. just doing HD. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. I, I again, we have to remember we're dealing with reflections. So, if you start your base reflection with something very specular. Say you just used a raw B board as a bounce. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's going to be the hardest bounce. Well, not hardest because you can use a high, uh, a high line or a grip, which is also a very specular bounce. Um, but if you start with a very specular bounce, you have to remember that even though it's a bounce source, it's still going to be hard because we're dealing with HD, mm-hmm. not SD, where it was different. When HD, SD, you can light significantly harder than you do now um, and get away with some of the, the uh, flaws that you can't do now in HD, mm-hmm. um, which is awesome because it's like, I feel like we're lighting with even less light. I mean, I, I feel sometimes where we're, you know, our key starts at a two, you know, where it's like, you know, before I remember I was lighting probably at like a five, six minimum for keys. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you mean by two and five and six? Oh, uh, like an F-stop. Oh, okay. Like F-stop. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it changed. I mean, I'm from when I when I started, it was, you know, with the Airy D20 where it was like the sensor was probably only 200 IRA or ISO. Um and then it worked its way up to whatever, I guess the Bennett, not 
the Viper. It was the Viper, which I think was, I think, made in 500 at ISO. Um, and then you started getting into all those um, HVXs when people were doing like music videos with the the movie tubes and all the um, the film adapters that they used to use. Mm-hmm. But that, I mean, that was still like native 200 ISO, which and you had to light so much more. Um, and now, you know, you have cameras at a native 5,000 ISO mm. or two, 200, uh, 2,500 ISO or, you know, at, you know, um, at 1,200 ISO, you're still seeing in the dark with no grain, mm. you know. Um, and they're, these cameras just natively are just becoming so powerful that, you know, lighting becomes so acute at this point where you're actually um, understanding how soft, like where you're using double muslin opposed to one layer of muslin mm-hmm. when you're diffusing. Um, mm-hmm. You're using magic cloth now, which is, you know, one of the, the heaviest diffusions in, the, in a cloth form that you can have instead of, you know, light grid where most people were using, mm-hmm. um, which light grid's beautiful, but it's now it's, you know, people are lighting such a, with such a rich natural look that you just want something that much more diffused. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's easier to light now than it was like 15 years ago? I don't think it's easier. I think the technique is different. Mm-hmm. Um, because, again, using the word easy means that anyone can do it. And you can, but I, I feel like, you know, I don't want to get lost in the words. I think it's 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 not easier. It's just different. Mm-hmm. Um, because you still have to do the same amount of work. Um, or... Even less. It depends. It all depends on where you are, the location, um, your team, how large your team is, the scale of the job. Um, and it might just be all grip work, mm-hmm. where it's just bounce boards and in a, a negative field. Mm-hmm. Okay. So have you seen um, Euphoria mm-hmm. on HBO? What do you think of that? I think it's a beautiful um, depiction of, I guess, teen life now. Um, a lot of colors. Um, the content is uh, very current. Um, very current. Uh, I liked it. I mean, it's kind of hard to watch at a point because as an adult, you have to remember that you're watching kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that the suspension of disbelief allowed, like, took me completely out of that where I was like, oh, wow, I'm actually watching. I felt like I was there. a teenager. Yeah. yeah. I was yeah. like, and I was like, I got to be careful because I'm watching teenagers, Um, but beautiful, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, And the story was, you know, very complex because, I mean, it was a narrative that seemed so foreign to someone my age, um, but I'm sure it's a very um, prevalent um, narrative for someone of that generation. Because I I, honestly, I'm not going to try to say I understand the social media world as much as you know, most most people do, mm-hmm. um, or the internet, as most people do, because it's becoming its own reality. It's becoming its own world, um, and that's what it kind of pretty much articulated. How you know you can be in this vast world and isolate at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, you could be exposed to so much, but also be so disconnected at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, you can be dealing with so many elements in your life. And also feel so afraid, you know. Um, But getting back to lighting, I I, I felt like it was beautiful, and and it never took away, it never took away my experience Mm -hmm. of the the show. How do you how do you think the lighting in that and Euphoria complements? I guess everything you were just saying. Well, I mean, you know, most of the characters needed color. Most of the characters needed pop. I mean, and you you saw and. There's a lot of like dance scenes where they had like a lot of like purples and blues and, you know, it felt young. It felt vibrant. It felt um, like an element where you were watching a bunch of, you know, teenagers at a party or, or in that moment felt like you were with a bunch of, you know, girls in a, in a happy, bubbly moment. Um, but you also felt these dark moments. Mm-hmm. Like, and they were appropriately placed. Mm -hmm. Like, you felt these really dark moments where, um, you were, you felt uncomfortable because you didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and they were all used well. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I never felt as if I was distracted by the lighting in any of those scenes. Yeah. It's all pretty dark, though. Yeah. Most of the, the series well, is I mean, pretty like, dark. I feel like that's kind of like the brand that everyone's starting to go for, that mm-hmm. more, more filmic aesthetic, you know, allowing yourself to ride below 50 IRE just so that it's has this filmic look. Because mm-hmm. um, most people are shooting on, you know, Alexas, which are a little bit more open uh, on the contrast end, and, you know, you're... Your shadows aren't as bold as a red. So, you know, you could take those chances, and, you know, because you know that if you have your key at a, you know, whatever you're, you're lighting it. I mean, some people generally like to shoot wide open so they can keep the depth of field. Mm-hmm. So if your key is roughly at a 2.8, two, eight, two, eight, two split, you can get a nice, you know, soft shadow on the, on the opposite side. Mm-hmm. Do you, uh, do you, work with colorists at all the, like prior to shooting I, I don't dps do um and that's part of the the onset color grading that they do mm-hmm. with like lots and stuff like that which help a lot um when you're lighting because you kind of know where the post flow is going to be mm-hmm. um because you know that it might be a contrast heavy um, show so you know that you're going to have to beef up the lights so that you don't have as much shadow in certain areas i mean again in post they can dodge and burn everything and lift things and power window it's it's technology is insane now in comparison to where it used to be yeah especially with davinci and how much do you know about i mean it seems like you know a lot about color colors and i again i i like photography so i dabble in a lot of it just so i can kind of stay in the know i mean i do a little bit of shooting um because i just i like being able to know what what the process is um and yeah i mean i think it's important to have a wholesome understanding of it i mean the more knowledge you have the better you can you know offer the more you can offer to a production yeah to be honest i mean i feel like the more you know i mean obviously you don't want to step on anyone's toes you don't want to be in the way of someone because you know that but it's like it, it's helpful to know that if uh it's it's helpful to know because you can assist somebody. You know yeah. that you can't put that there because that might cause an audio feedback. You don't want to run cables over sound cables because that might cause, you know, an audio feedback. Um, you know, you don't want to. I mean, you know that you don't want to really shine a, a camera into a lens because it's it, you know. I mean, sorry, a light. You don't want to shine a light <laughs> into the lens because uh, you know it's going to create a flare. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's you know unless it was intentional. Um, so it's just the understanding of all those things. And, you know, if you can beat that before um, you shoot, you save so much time, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, you, and for example, like if I was, you know, um, setting up a direct source that I knew the grips were going to have to put a frame in front of, I would back it up so that they would have enough room to do what they had to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, and then that saves time instead of them asking me, Hey, can you move this light back? Mm-hmm. Um, or, um, prepare it for a bounce when they're when you know they're about to set up a bounce. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, have you seen the Revenant? I have. That I love. That and movie. I'm just amazed by the fact that, that they didn't that they use all available is, lighting. That first scene. Is oh yeah, yeah. The first thirty <laughs> seconds. The fr- I'm not joking. The first thirty seconds. I'm also mad that that bear did not get <laughs> an award for. Be- oh, for the bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. No, no, man. It was an amazing performance. It was <laughs> fucking amazing. But no, I swear, the first 30 seconds, I was like, this is the best cinematography I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, yes, exactly. I, that's the I, thought I, I had. No, I understand. I mean, it was a great scene. I, I thought it was a great scene. I mean, it a lot of movement. I mean, that movie's great. I mean, I, I, I mean, he has his finger on the pulse. Yeah. I mean, but there's a lot of directors out there like that too now, and that like you watch their movies and you know that the next movie's going to be good. Mm-hmm. I but mean, but with with the Revenant, it was all available lighting. Oh yeah, and they. I mean, did you watch any of the behind the scenes? I didn't. Oh okay, I'll let you watch that. But I mean, they talk about how much because I mean they shot it in the winter, like in the I guess the uh, winter desert, so it was like mm-hmm. all snow everywhere. And I mean. It's a beautiful thing because you have this huge, big bounce everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's nice. You have, you know, you have light sources all over the place and, you know, you could shoot time of day. But it's also, you got to remember, you're shooting that far south that the sun is out until 
11 p.m. Oh, okay. <laughs> so they had they had a little more wiggle room. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a beautiful movie. I mean, you know, available light is. I I feel like people don't appreciate it as much as they should because, I mean, maybe now I'm also thinking of my age group, but um, it, it, available light is is powerful. I mean, that image is insane if you can mold it the right way. Um, I've seen some shots where there is no light. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're literally in a room with these big windows, massive windows, and it's just doing all the work. And you're mm-hmm. just like, "How did you do that?" You're like, <laughs> "Yeah, I just well, put the you camera know. down." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> of course, I'm going to say, "Yeah, well, we had you know two 18Ks out the window mm-hmm. with a lift." No, um, but no, it's literally just available light, and it's beautiful. Um, amazing. Yeah, mm. good stuff. Um, about I mean, you can't recreate. I mean, that's what you're recreating, and that's the thing that. You know, I you know I keep stressing where it's like you have to like you have to watch what the sun does. I tell like when I used to do a lot of lectures um, at NYU, I used to just tell them like if you're going to, if you're looking for a certain aesthetic, sit in the room. You know, at least you know where time at least during the times where time passes, right? So like you know it's going to be a different sun at noon, and you know it's going to be a different sun. 10 a.m. and you also know it's going to be a different sun at four. So mm-hmm. just sit in the room and just watch how that sun moves. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many apps that you can use now, like Sun Path, Sun Tracker. But if you don't understand what that angle is, just watch it. Because mm-hmm. sometimes the sun at four o'clock is beautiful in certain windows because it's sitting in like it's in a, a west facing window and it's just this beam that just comes straight into the window and it's like this amber look depending on what region or what time of year it is and, and it's nice. I mean, you can't, I mean, that's what we're replicating. Mm. You know, people get so caught up in, you know, I need HMIs, but the sun is powerful. Mm. The sun is really strong. Sun's the best light and it's free. Yeah, and it's free. It's free light. <laughs> what about, um? have you seen um Tangerine, the movie I've on the iPhone? It was shot I've with an it. iPhone. I've seen it. Now, what, what, what tips would you have for shooting with the with the phone uh I, w- I mean if you've never done it before i would say definitely shoot test mm-hmm. i mean i mean anything that you have any format that you haven't shot with shoot test mm-hmm. because every format has a different um, challenge like you know the highlights might blow when you're in full sun and you might not want that for your film or um the shadows might get crunchy because it is such a low resolution um or a bit bit rate um so that you might not like that. So it's like, just, you know, find out what your ideal situation is for those um, applications. Mm-hmm. Okay. Would you shoot on an iPhone? Why not? Mm-hmm. I mean, you could shoot 4K now, right? Yes. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> the new iPhone has like three cameras on it. Yeah. Oh, wow. You saw that? No, I haven't. Yeah, it's ridiculous. That's yeah. three cameras. Um, Or three lenses, rather. So uh-huh. it's like, you could do like wide and oh, all this wow. stuff. Yeah. That's insane. I I don't think I don't follow that, so I don't know. But mm-hmm. I don't see why you shouldn't. I mean, it. So many people that have done it, and I've seen commercial shot on a Sony Galaxy. I've seen commercial shot on my iPhone. So mm-hmm. all tangible things. Mm-hmm. I mean, again, you have like if you're shooting it, I'm, and I'm just speaking um, as if I was talking as a DP. It's it's just understanding the format, just like any other camera. Um, you know, versus like Nikon when you're shooting stills versus Canon, you know, just understand your format. I mean, if you, if you appreciate that and respect it, you can get the best image, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. Okay. You said earlier, sometimes you work autonomously and sometimes you don't. Does, is there a preference that you have? I don't know. It's like, it's, it's interesting because I enjoy it because I, I enjoy what I do. Um, it's fun when you work with a team of collaborators because you're just experiencing it all organically um and it's generally on fill i mean obviously you know for producers it's not it's it's work we're doing work we're we're working very hard um but it's fill it's it's really kind of like vibing in the moment and understanding that you know this might be different tomorrow and but right now this feels great um you know this silhouetted body looks great like it looks amazing let's shoot this this is great I mean, let's not add any more. I think we got it. Let's mm-hmm. let's go. Let's shoot. Um, whereas, you know, it all depends. Like, I mean, you know, being on a a project where it's just based off of the scout. I mean, it's 
just as clean as it is on a collaborating set. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just it's just a style of shooting, literally. Mm-hmm. Um, I generally enjoy collaborating because it's fun. I feel like you're playing. Um, not saying that the latter is uh, um, is less fun, but I mean, it's just different. It's mm-hmm. just a different process. Okay. Um, is there? I guess what's what's something that you learned in the past year or so in regards to like being on set? Don't leave. No, seriously, um, don't leave set because the thing about lighting is that things change so fast. Um, again, if you're lighting on a studio, it's different, right? Um, because it's very controlled. Um, but when you're lighting on location, things change so fast that you know you just have to be able to adapt. And I think that's the best part about filmmaking or the filmmaking processes is just we're just people who just are trained to adapt. Like we're, you know, some people make the equation like equated to like being a soldier but it's like just always ready <laughs> I know, well i mean you know in the sense that you're always nothing's perfect yeah it's not perfect it's always going to be something different and you're always going to create an obstacle that you're going to have to overcome um and that's the that's the best part about it for me at least because it's like it's even though i had a plan the plan's going to change it's going to change again and it's just how to, to manage that change you know mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and it. I mean, I, I, it's fun. I, I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. I enjoy it the most, I, and that's why I say just stay on set because you learn so much more, um, and you learn, you know, watching the light change and understand what you did versus what the the the, uh, the ambient light is doing or the light from the exterior is doing because you know a scene might run long and outside changes, and sometimes you might have to supplement it to create something that we saw this morning from the beginning of the scene that we have to shoot okay. when we turn around. Okay. So what's the best way to become a gaffer outside of like actually shooting stuff? Well, I mean, I, I felt like when I was in college, uh, I think the best class that I took, um, the, the professor made us do a daily journal of like our experience of light. So every day we had to watch something new, whether it was, a neon sign on someone's face, whether it was, um, you know, the sun setting, whether it was um, a street light, anything. It was just a journal on how a lighting experience that you saw. And it's it's even easier now because now you can have a cell phone and take a picture so you can actually look at it again and articulate it. Um, whereas then it was just, you know, just writing it down and, you know, being in the moment and thinking about what you thought was actually happening you know watching a sunset i remember i was like this is a this is a 5k bouncing into a bounce board um with a amber with an amber um gel on it Mm. um uh you know um this is a this is a fluorescent tube uh on someone's face but i mean you you just start seeing what light is doing and how light is producing itself i mean even though innately a fluorescent or a neon is um, a soft source it can be really hard on someone's face when mm-hmm. it's like when you have a high contrast um image mm-hmm. um and i think that's the best way it's just you know journaling watching light taking photography taking pictures writing notes on the pictures you see um, just so you can start understanding what light is doing and you know with your eye you can you know survey and see what it's doing maybe the sun is literally bouncing up of a building Right. Mm. And that's the same thing we do on set. We bounce big sources off of bigger sources mm-hmm. to make us all. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and, and again, we were talking off air about this, but I, I think it's important to, to, to have this conversation because, you know, it seems as if um, it's such an intangible place to be, right? Mm. To be a filmmaker. It sounds like, you know, most people are like, there is no structure to this. There, This is something that, you know, you do in your free time. This is not a career. You know, I've heard that from my parents. I mean, they, they support me, but mm-hmm. I'm just saying, you know, going into a career that's based in art, most people are fearful because it's like, how do you make money? Um, and, and you know, it's just articulating these points and understanding that it's a craft and you're creating um, these images and you could do it. And, and it's possible just, you know, and especially now that there's so many formats that you can just, you know, pull a phone out of your pocket and Mm -hmm. shoot something Mm -hmm. i mean and it's you know you can be either a youtube person or an instagram person and it's boom you're you're done like and you're you're 
you know, you build a buzz about yourself and they're beautiful images and no one needs to know that that's your sister or your cousin mm -hmm. or your brother or some guy you just saw on the street. It's an image. That's all they see. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful image. And they're like, wow. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's the thing that, um, you know, I, I feel like articulating is important because it is tangible and it's so tangible. It's even more tangible now because we have access to so much more technology. Yeah with a higher quality opposed to before when you only could shoot 35 mil mm -hmm. or you had to have an icon camera or you had to have a Canon camera to capture any image, period. Mm -hmm. Now you have a cell phone that can capture higher quality image than most cameras did, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. Professional grade cameras. Yeah. It's crazy. You just got to, just got to start, start small and just take it one step yeah, at a time. And it's, but the thing about it is people get so caught up in having to have, you know, this actor or this whatever, whatever. It's like shoot something with a friend, shoot something with your mom, shoot something with, you know, your brother. And, and no one knows. Mm -hmm. Literally, if it looks beautiful and it's a great narrative, no one knows at all. Mm -hmm. You don't have to explain it to anyone because they're just watching it. Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't have to be self-conscious because someone's watching it and you're like, that's content, done. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. Create something else. Awesome. I'm inspired right now. I'm inspired. Cool. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Uh, I mean, overall, I'm 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 actually just excited to even be here. I mean, I for me, what, what would be helpful is if I had you know questions from people who actually want to know uh, anything about lighting. I mean, because that I can actually you know direct my attention to what would be helpful to you know independent filmmakers in this sense. I know when I was starting, um, you know, it was just access 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 and you know it was also you know being able to get the opportunity to light again mm -hmm. um, whereas now it's a little bit different because you know i'm at a place where i'm working more frequently but it was just like how do i have time to light like i need to just practice my craft yeah yeah um and you know generally it's just on shoots mm -hmm. and you know if you don't have motivated friends that are you know shooting just to play and create something it's it's hard mm -hmm. and then you know you're stagnant and then you come back and you're cold and you're starting light again and you're like ah oh. yeah i went i went through that cycle because yeah. there was a time where i wanted to um be a gaffer on sets and i had like a mentor type figure who would bring me on a set but it was so infrequent and i had a hard time finding work in between that it was like I, I couldn't remember basic things and I and then I felt kind of insecure because I didn't want to be on set and like fuck anything up and or move too slow in, yeah. yeah so it was like yo how do I do this so I thought about buying construction lights and I thought about just 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 buying lights and doing it on my own and it was really hard and I kind of just was like well I, I don't really need to be a master at this mm -hmm. but it was something that I wanted to do to supplement my income yeah. and learn and be on films and stuff like that. So it's really tricky finding that. I mean, you have to have, like you said, you have to have that, those friends and, um, they just go out and, and learn. And it's hard if you, if you don't, if you're not, if you didn't go to film school to yeah. just kind of jump on right. like sets. What I mean, I don't know what it is now, but I know when I started Craigslist and Mandy were like, great tools yeah I, I, again i don't know because i haven't had to do this in a while and i don't want to sound ignorant saying this but those are great tools like mm -hmm. i mean i would take jobs that were free just so i can get the reps i would take jobs that were 75 bucks just so i can get the reps i would take jobs that you know might not have even required me to do lighting just so i can get the reps and mm -hmm. be on set um and that was important to me was getting the reps you know because the hour more hours i had doing what i love the better i can articulate how um you know how you know i can sculpt my process and um articulate my vision through the lights mm -hmm. or through lighting yeah so you you mentioned that you wish you could answer questions was it which i think is a decent transition into um what we're working on with black film space and justin is um right now it's our it's September, 2019. And, um, in early November, 2019, um, we want to have Justin host a lighting workshop. So if you're listening to this in October, um, please join us sometime in November. We don't have a specific date, but it'll, it'll be on our social media and email. 
and um, you can learn a lot more about lighting. Yeah, I mean, and come with, I mean, come with as many questions as possible. I mean, even if it has nothing to do with the course uh, that we're teaching, um, because it's important. I mean, I feel like the more informed you are, the the better you can become an artist. And, you know, obviously a lot of it is experimenting um, and, you know, learning what you like and what your aesthetic is. But sometimes you just need that understanding if you're you know in the right direction or if you're you know doing something that you know would hinder your process not saying it would but you might feel that way and you know it's like just ask questions and be open because that's what it is i mean we're artists we're very vulnerable and Mm -hmm. we do this because we love it Mm -hmm. so you said something where you know about finding kind of like your artistry in lighting are there like like I know it like cinematography, like I can look at different cinematographers and be like, that's their style. Are you able to do that with like gaffers and lighting technicians? Yeah. Like, yo, I, mean, I can, do I can that tell that. I can do that with my friends. Yeah. People that I know um, very well and people that, you know, we came up in the same circles. Um, um, again, it's, it's per taste. I mean, it's every, got everybody's different. Um, there's some gaffers who, uh, rely on the DP. There's some gaffers that are autonomous. There's some gaffers that collaborate. Um, so it all depends. I mean, again, I can I know when my friends are doing it. Mm-hmm. I can see them and I know their tricks. I know what they like by by watching the film. By you're like, okay, film. that's yeah. I can tell that's their technique. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's I would love to be at that <laughs> that point where I could I could uh, point that out. That's dope. Um. All right, Justin, thank you very yeah. much for joining us on I'm the Black excited. Film Space podcast. Thank you for inviting me. I, I really appreciate it. Appreciate you being excited. Um, are you working on anything now that you'd like to share with us? I am. I, unfortunately, I can't talk about any of them okay. because they're all works in process. Um, but great things. Um, uh, Can we follow you anywhere on social media? Unfortunately, I'm not a social media guy. That's perfect. I know. No, that's perfect. (laughs) Sometimes I feel guilty about it because everyone really wants to connect that way. And, you know, I I, I just never really was attracted to it, so I never really took it serious. Um, But no, I wish I was. Um, Okay. But if anyone has anything that they want to say, if you guys want to filter it through like a forum that you guys have, I will answer any question. Okay. Thanks for listening to the Black Film Space podcast. If you're interested in being part of our community and attending events, please visit us at blackfilmspace.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Black Film Space. Subscribe to our email list and podcast. All right, see you soon.